All right, since everybody is here on time, uh, we'll get started on time, if that's okay. <laughs> we'll, res we'll respect you for making the effort to get all the way down the hill to here. This was originally scheduled in the Commons, and they moved us uh, late last week because of a scheduling conflict. So we appreciate you making the effort to come down the hill. Um, I'm Dr. Matthew Wappet. I am the co-director of the University of Idaho Confucius Institute. Um, this is the third in our uh, fall series of uh, China on the Palouse seminars, uh, where we have asked uh, University of Idaho faculty members who have done work in and with China uh, to sort of uh, describe their experience and their perspective on working with China and sort of the uh, current uh, state of the world as it relates to specifically Idaho and China. So today um, we're excited to have Dr. Sanjay Sisodia here from the College of Business and Economics. Uh, Sanjay, I met Sanjay, what, about a year ago or so? Probably about a year ago um, and became familiar with his work. Uh, he does a lot of work on open innovation, uh, inter-firm relationships, uh, has a pretty extensive publication record that I will not try to share with you, uh, but pretty impressive. Uh, and he's also spent uh, quite a bit of time in China um, and working with uh, Chinese business and specifically looking at Chinese innovation. Um, so we're really excited to hear from Sanjay today. So I believe that we will, uh, Sanjay will talk for about 20 to 30 minutes and then we'll have a lot of time there at the end for some questions and open interaction. So when Sanjay is done, don't get up and leave. Um, Please, uh, please hold your question. We like to facilitate some time for some dialogue. So anyway, without any further ado, we'll turn it over to Sanjay. I had a look at the time. Uh, good afternoon. How's everybody doing? Hopefully good. You know, just a few days away from break, right? Okay, so I'm uh, Sanjay Sisodia. I'm an associate professor of marketing in the College of Business and Economics. I'm also an affiliate uh, associate professor of renewable materials in the College of Natural Resources. I had to remember that one. And then affiliate associate professor in engineering management for the College of Engineering as well. Uh, and that ties into a little bit of my topic today. My background is rather diverse. So I teach um, Introduction to Business, Introduction to Marketing. I teach a senior capstone class in product development. I teach uh, graduate level courses in engineering management as well as uh, in the MBA program uh, for UI and WSU as well. Um, or have for WSU, but currently uh, considering uh, for the UI program. So I'll talk a little bit about my background and how it ties into this. I was fortunate to uh, go to China in the late 80s. I was in high school at the time and it really opened up my eyes to to the perception of what China, compared to the perception of what we have of China and what China really is at the time. And since then, I had a fascination about wanting to learn more about it. And it tied into a little bit of the research I've been working on in the past few years, and I'll talk about that research project in just a little bit. So in uh, 2015, I had a chance to teach international marketing at, in Shanghai. And when I was in Shanghai, I also had an opportunity to interact with people in the business community. Uh, primarily in the finance sectors, and how innovation and the culture of innovation is actually radically changing what is occurring in China. So it's really fascinating for me. So I was able to validate a lot of the thoughts that I've got regarding China. The challenge is, is much of the current literature, uh, academic literature at least, does not touch on the vast difference of how innovation is treated in China today than what it was many years ago. Many people are still under the mindset that the process of innovation in China is the method that was used 20, 30 years ago, when today it's actually a very vibrant and actively moving environment. So I'm going to talk a little bit about, from an academic standpoint, it's an academic uh, presentation, about how the environment has changed a great deal. And in particular, I'm going to apply this concept of open innovation in that realm, which is something that has been discussed in China, but not studied very well. So I'll talk a little bit about the background for my research project that I'm going to very likely be working on in part next summer and then the following summer. Uh, development of the research question, I'll look a little bit at the conceptual model of conceptual development and how to actually gather the data for this because it is a challenge to gather data at the uh, research um, institutions. So background, <clears throat> new product development in general for most organizations is near and dear to the heart of the strategic orientation of the firm, meaning that it's very important for firms to be able to develop products timely, efficiently, etc. So many organizations tie it in to the competitive strategy of the firm. So how do we develop and advance products for the customers when they need it, where they want it, and do so efficiently because shareholders, stakeholders want to see value. And shareholders want to see sales and profits. So how do we become more efficient 
at how we do this. So there's push within the organization to make products quickly at a lower cost. And that's challenging because we've all done this before where we try and do something in haste and we actually do so poorly. We, it comes at a greater cost later on because we make mistakes, um, make errors, it costs us more. We could actually even erode what's called brand equity for the firm by introducing products that are garbage. And that's happened many times before. Even Apple's done this. So I pick on Apple at times in a good way, uh, but I'll use them as an example. In general, we're, what we're seeing at the global level and within the U.S., we're seeing a high level of dynamic markets. And what that means is a lot of change. So we have change occurring in technology. We have change occurring in markets. We have change occurring with customers. We have change occurring within the competitive environment within organizations. So there's a lot of change going on. So how do you manage this change and make products efficiently? Really is what it's coming down to. So some of the methods and the themes that we're considering in the Western world have been applied to some degree in Asian markets, African markets, and some parts of Eastern Europe, but with very limited success. So what I'm going to look at today is essentially a way to possibly improve performance. Procter & Gamble's probably one of the poster child type of firms to look at when we talk about product development. Most of us are familiar with their products. They have 12 brands that are worth a billion dollars a piece. Tide Laundry Detergent, one of their premier brands. So you might be thinking, what the heck does Tide Laundry Detergent have to do with product development? It's not just Tide Laundry Detergent. Procter & Gamble has to routinely develop and introduce new products. And they have to do so efficiently. Because if they come too late to the game, a company like Unilever could come along with a better product, beat them to the market. If they do so at a higher cost, then it makes it challenging for them to come in with an appropriate price point for their products. So they face a considerable amount of problems about 15 years back. And it's an interesting story here. They were spending a lot of money on product development. They were having high product failure rates, sometimes in the order of 60% or 80% of the products that they were introducing were failing in the marketplace. That's not a good number in consumer products put a lot of money into research and development. They had about 4,500 individuals working in research and development, engineering in various forms within the organization, and the process had become slow and cumbersome. They weren't getting things done quickly. Shareholders are rather upset because of the ineffective side of the research and development group. So there was a push. Laughly, the CEO at the time, I believe this is in 2000 or 2002, came along and said, we're going to have to make a change. What we're going to now require is 50% or more of the products we produce are going to have a component, a critical component, a component, whatever, that comes from outside the company. We're not going to do everything in-house. And that's an interesting thing because you don't have to advance all the science to develop a new product within your organization. What if you buy, borrow, learn from your competitors, other organizations, and do something better maybe? So instead of doing everything in-house, what can you learn from your environment and do possibly a better job? And that leads to this concept of open and closed innovation. So the traditional perspective of product development is this. I'm a company. I know how to make products in my industry better than anybody else. I'm the best. So there's this thing called a not invented here syndrome, NIH, where you have to invent products by yourself because you're the best at what you do. Don't trust your competition. Don't trust other organizations, but that's not necessarily true. What if you're so blinded by your environment that you're not able to really learn from new science organizations, your customers, consumers, and you make the wrong products? Case in point, Cisco. So we're all familiar with Cisco Systems, one of the largest network organizations on the planet. They had produced so many products for their customers that they thought they figured out what products that the market really needed. Unfortunately, when, you had, when they had an economic downturn, they got stuck sitting on a lot of inventory, and they had to write down $2 billion of inventory because they lost sight of what the customer really wanted and were essentially selling older technologies to some of these customers. So closed innovation is this concept. I'm going to develop everything by myself. I'm going to do the research and development. I'm going to manufacture. I'm going to sell the product. But that has challenges because not all companies have the ability to develop all aspects of a product. I'll give you an example. Some of you might be familiar with the eraser stick, the little, little porous material that we use to clean uh, countertops, toilets, and all that kind of stuff in bathrooms. 
The company that wanted to produce it got stuck. We need to find a material that we can use to clean a surface but doesn't scratch it. So just think about, I mean, we're in Moscow. We've got hard water and we get accumulation of sediments and all that kind of stuff. So how do we clean that surface without actually scratching that surface? So the company sat on this one for a little bit, didn't know what to do with it. We can't come up with this material. We can't figure out what to do. So they did what was a call for proposals. They went out to the market and said, hmm, we need to find a material that we can use on cultured marble, whatever types of surfaces, that can clean it but not scratch it. They actually found a material in a market. Just in, it was actually a, it's a, a traditional market. They found this material just sitting around. And one of the buyers just happened to be out and said, what's this material for? It was actually developed for the automotive industry to sand auto bodies. When you sand an auto body, you don't want to scuff it up too much because then you end up having to go back and do a lot more prep work. Well, that material was developed by BASF, if I recall right. So BASF developed a material for the automotive industry. This company came along and said, hmm, we can actually use that same concept as a cleaning product. And hence, we have the racer stick. Completely different industry, adapting someone's science for your use. You don't have to spend all that time on research and development, testing things out if you're able to partner and borrow from other entities. So that's the realm of open innovation. How do I connect with my environment? How do I connect with other companies, other organizations, scientific groups, universities, to advance my product development capability? So this thing about open innovation is rather fascinating because it makes sense, but how does it really work? What do we need to do in order to be successful with it? Because what had happened was when this concept came along by Henry Chesbro in 2000, 2002, 2003, it was neat, but nobody really knew how to be successful with it. So a lot of researchers have spent time on trying to figure out how to be successful with this concept. So just to give you an idea exactly with what's going on with open innovation, let's look at the traditional, what's called a stage gate process for product development where you come up with a whole bunch of ideas at the company level and you're looking at time going across. So you come up with a whole bunch of ideas. Some ideas are decent. You might want to build a prototype, think about what to do with it, take it in the development phase, and then bring it out to commercialization to the market. But if you look, there's that little funnel looking thing being the boundary of the company. It's like the wall of an organization. See, it's a solid line here. So everything has to come from within the company to do so correctly. But that's a challenge, because can you always come up with the best ideas yourself? Very likely not. Someone might have a good idea to help you do something better. So the key here is the boundary of the firm. And when we take a look at this thing called open innovation, what we're saying is the boundary of the company, the firm, the organization, whatever it is, is permeable. It's got little holes. Stuff comes in, stuff comes out. Not just at ideation, but at any stage in product development. And there's lots of examples on uh, what that really means, but I'll just show it to you pictorially. So we've got the same little gray dots I showed you earlier, right in the middle. Some are moving along. But what about stuff from outside the company? Can ideas come inside? Procter & Gamble actually works with consulting companies to come up with new ideas for products. What happens if I get to a point where some idea sounds kind of promising, but I don't know what to do with it. Maybe I could sell it. Maybe I could license it. So you're essentially trying to get greater utility out of your research and development capability. So that makes sense. I mean, it's a pretty straightforward concept here. The challenge with open innovation, I know it's a little bit of a dense slide. You don't need to write that down is you have to have a deliberate and what's called a sustained approach to product development. This is not one of those things that sounds like a good idea, I'm going to do it for a few minutes, and then in traditional operations management mode, jump to another idea next month. It's not a silver, silver bullet a month club, not in any way, bless you. Um, because you have to commit resources to do this right. And what that means is you can't just change what you're doing. You can't be a rudderless ship. So it's written or it's underpinned, it's written down by a considerable number of processes that are important. So we really ask ourselves, what makes open innovation work? Sounds interesting. So this is the area of research that I've spent uh, my time on um, since I was a grad student. The key with open innovation is to be able to connect. We can't all be walking around in a market to come up with ideas to make that new eraser stick. So 
managing those connections is critical. And that's the highlight of the research study that I'm uh, going to be pursuing. So investigating success, we're going to take a look at the conceptual model that I'm going to propose, which is in part rooted in what do we mean by success? Because beauty is in the eye of the beholder in many ways. What do we really mean by success? A capitalist might say, might say, profitability, increased shareholder value. What about being more efficient within the company? What about creating more jobs? Utilizing resources better. So when we look at product development, we're often considering what are called process outcomes and product outcomes. Can I make more products in the same amount of time? That's a product outcome. Process would be to be more efficient, possibly. Utilize less resources, possibly. And many argue that we should consider process outcomes as well as product outcomes. And Abby uh, Griffin is uh, one of the ch uh, champions for this particular concept because when we're looking at product development, you tend to see process-related activities before you see outcomes. So that's why we need to, uh, to consider both of them. We also may want to consider firm-level effects because if we go back to that first slide that I had earlier on, not the one with my name on it, but the one that considered product development, Firm level effects is tied to the strategy of the company because it's important to the success in many organizations. So we want to connect innovativeness to firm performance. So essentially, some of you may have seen uh, proposed models before or uh, uh, models that we want to investigate. We've got this concept of open innovation. And in general, does it work or does it not work? Is it a good idea? Is it a bad idea? And it's important to consider that in the role of Chinese markets and innovation in China because nobody's actually done it yet. Nobody's studied this concept there. They've considered it, but not actually done a full-blown data collection. And what that means is, I'm going to look at open innovation. If a company does open innovation or not, can I look at how quickly they introduce products? So what is the rate of introduction? How unique are these products? And that's innovativeness. Because uniqueness can be important at the competitive level. So that different product might have a competitive advantage over rival products. Options creations is a term that's used for platform products. So this product can be used as a component in many other products. And this last one, financial performance, which is near and dear to the heart for many people managing organizations because there's pressures for financial performance. Good. I talked about connections before. And this term called IRs comes up, and that's interfirm relationships. We could argue that it's an interorganizational relationship, meaning one entity tied to another. But quite often, when we look at product development, it's one company with another company. But the concepts still apply here, and it's perfectly applicable in the uh, domain that we're going to consider in just a little bit. So firms have to be able to not only maintain existing relationships, but they also have to be able to identify new ones. So you got to make new ones, you got to manage existing ones. It's almost like having a good friend circle. Friends are going to come in and out of your circle, it happens, but you got to be able to recruit good friends as well because in times of need, you want to be able to be connected. So developing interfirm relational knowledge stores is important. So Johnson, Zoe, Graywall, are, uh, they have the seminal piece in this environment. It's how do you actually measure interfirm relationships? So there's a way to measure it, just a way to figure out how to actually put a scale together. How do you actually find out if somebody's got good interfirm relationships or not? So what I did was I considered the role of interfirm relationships, and it's operationalized, just language to say that we developed a scale. So we developed a scale off of existing measures by Johnson Zoe Graywall and created a new one called initiation. So how strong are my relationships right now? That's nice. But at times, we have to be able to connect quickly. And that's why this last bullet is up there, initiation. So some companies are able to manage existing relationships. They're the gorilla in their industry. Everyone wants to partner with them. But that might not necessarily say that you have the ability to create new ones. You go out and get new ones. Because at times, when you don't have the science, you partner up with somebody else. Can you use their science? And are, of course, are they willing to let you use it? So open innovation is really important to consider along with an evaluation of your connections. So there's this term that we borrow from the sociology group and anthro groups, social network theory and social network characteristics. 
So how are we connected? Not whether we can connect or have the ability to connect, but how are we connected right now? So we look at these concepts that are pretty near and dear to being important in this area because they can influence the flow of information. So if you're not connected, you're not going to know what's going on. What if there are barriers to the flow of information? So things are going on on Friday night. Your friend circle doesn't communicate something to you. It could be a miscommunication. It could also be weak connections. So what we want to do is be able to establish strong connections such that when science is being developed, you can connect to it and connect to it quickly. You know about it. It's available. So we look at, act, we call them actors and nodes and relationships and things like that. So we're looking at the roles by actors and the relationships between them. So in this particular case, because we're talking about companies, companies are actors themselves and the relationships between them. How strong are those connections? Because the strength of those connections can influence the type of information that goes back and forth. Okay, that makes sense. So we call actors nodes just from a social network theory standpoint, and the relationships are often called links or ties. Strength of ties is a, a common discussion in this area. But what about the strength of weak ties? Do you always have to have strong ties to figure what out, what's going on in industry? Or can you have a blanket of a number of weak ties and leverage those ties so you figure out who's doing what on a regular basis? And if you need to leverage that tie, you can leverage the tie accordingly. The concept of network centrality, density, identity are critical in this area because centrality says how much of a hub are you in this network of communications. Density refers to the overall strength. Identity looks at the salience of your connection in this environment. Spillovers is pretty critical to the discussion that I'll have in just a little bit. Not everybody is connected right away. Not everybody is advancing science. But do you have the ability to capture information as it's available, capture science as it's available? So we have research communities working on science. Sometimes they just want to work on science just to advance science. They don't want a commercial benefit from it. They work on white papers. They work on advancing science in a particular community to help support one group or another. It doesn't matter what exactly is going on. But are there spillovers? Is there knowledge leaking out that we can borrow? And that's a really, really critical concept to what I'm going to talk about when we're talking about uh, when I'm looking at China in just a little bit. So essentially, and this is just a combination of the model here, we got open innovation influencing new product development. So if a company does open innovation, does it help them be more successful? And if they are doing open innovation, if they have a relational capability, meaning can they make connections, does that help them be more successful? But that's in part tied to how connected they are right now. So this is whether they can connect to, and this is how connected are they right now. So it's important, even for a small startup company, to engage in with your business environment to be successful at open innovation. So I'll talk a little briefly about the survey that I've developed, as well as a context for how I'm going to proceed with data collection in this environment, because the context is directly related to what's going on in China right now. So study design, the data source research instrument, which is essentially the survey instrument that we send out, the scales that we send out, as well as the method for data analysis. The data analysis is straightforward, but at the heart of this, and this is the primary purpose of the presentation today, China. So China is a fascinating environment to do business research in right now, in part because of its size. 1.3 billion people, sizable population. Not just the population is important for us to consider, but GDP growth. So it's a rapidly growing and evolving environment. 6.9% uh, GDP growth on a per annum basis, at least uh, provided by the World Bank, is very aggressive. In the U.S., we're hovering, what, between 2 and 3%? So it is a rapidly growing environment. There are other environments that we have rapid growth in, but not of the size of the nation that China has. So it's a large group growing quite rapidly. So the focus on innovation has changed a great deal in China in the last three decades, in a good way. There's been a lot of reform. There's been a lot of changes, a lot of structural changes that help advance innovation. So many argue that the environment for innovation is different in China 
than many other Asian countries, and of course, compared to the Western world. Not different in a bad way, but we need to take into account these differences in order to be successful. So there's a number of companies that have decided that they want to go into China and do open innovation. But they've struggled because they haven't really taken into consideration country differences. It's okay, perfectly fine. But if you take them into account, maybe you'll be a little bit more successful. So innovation in China is very far from being new. Paper, printing, gunpowder, the compass, all innovated in China. So there's a strong history of innovation in China. There's currently a very strong cons uh, concentrated effort, a concerted effort as well, to advance scientific communities. And what that means is there's a lot of support for advancing science. A lot of support for increasing entrepreneurial growth. There are some studies out there that say there are more millionaires made on a daily basis in China than any other country in the world. And that's in part tied to entrepreneurship. Advancing neat ideas. Coming up with commercial opportunities. So there's a big change in the environment for innovation in China. And this is very different than what's occurred in many other nations worldwide. Civil investments in research and development historically had limited support. But that perspective changed. In the 1980s, there were some reform, or there was some reform that occurred that advanced economic change. A lot more support for doing more science, university communities. So we had a stronger presence of industrial parks, areas where companies could advance science collectively, science parks where we're just working on science, incubators. We take those neat science ideas and we find commercial opportunities for them. University-led research communities have advanced considerably as well. So you've got a lot of science moving along now. Cool. How do you use that science to develop products now? How do you use that science to increase GDP growth, increase jobs? And that's the fascinating part that's going on. So open innovation in China is not exactly new because it's a concept that's actually been around for some time. The problem is nobody's really studied it well. It's a neat idea. Great. Okay. Go do it. Well, how do I be successful with it? So that's part of the study here is there's a historical perspective to rely on closed innovation. Keep everything in house. <clears throat> Keep it top secret. Do it the best you can by yourself. But quite often these projects get stuck. How do I partner with other companies, other entities, and advance science? So when I was in uh, Shanghai in summer of 15, one of the key concepts I kept coming up while I was talking to members of the business community was I'm trying to partner with this other group. We're trying to develop a partnership so that we can work together to move this company forward or use some of their technologies, they'll use some of our technologies, and maybe we can both collectively move forward. That's a very different perspective than what was done historically. So now there's much more of a concerted effort to work together and advance scientific communities. What had happened was a large number of uh, products that were being produced actually stem from some sort of industrial type of a collaboration. So you've got business to business environments working together, advancing science, but that wasn't showing up in consumer products a great deal. And consumer products is a large area of growth in China in part because of discretionary spend that has rapidly changed in China. There's some evidence that suggests that companies are willing to borrow from the outside world in China or outside the nation to help make their products better and move products along. So there's a little bit of evidence that supports that. Now we actually got to verify it. So that's where academics get to come in. Here my argument is that the firm is a unit of analysis, meaning we're going to use the company as a member of this network. They're going to be one of the nodes. We're going to use a company as members of networks and we're going to determine how much open innovation they do, to what extent, and are they successful at it. And essentially the role of their ability to connect with others and how connected they are. Because once we figure out exactly how some of these mechanisms work in China, then we can start working on policy and methods possibly to help increase productivity in China and be more efficient. It's not to say that there's a perfect answer there, but maybe to do things more efficiently would probably be a neat method <clears throat> to consider. So in terms of data collection, some of you that have an interest in academic research, we're going to use the total design method. 
which is a standard rule of thumb with many survey methods for primary data, and secondary data, patents, patenting, firm financial data when it's available. Quite often in this environment, it's going to be primary data that's going to drive a lot of what's going to happen. But how many companies do you actually go and get data from? It's a lot. And that's amongst the challenges with this particular data collection. In order to get um, a good understanding of how this is working, we need about 150 completed surveys, 150, 160 thereabouts. But not everybody wants to fill a survey out when you send it to them. Quite often, we throw them in a trash can, trash can, we give them to someone else to figure out, or we leave it on the desk and we'll get to it later. So we have what are called response rates. So how many people actually fill these things out? About 16%, 20% of people fill out, or companies will fill out a survey when you send it out. <clears throat> Ganeshan, uh, Malter, and Reinflesh have a, a rule of thumb for interfirm related research about 150 completed surveys. And this has been validated many times over. So I've had research studies along these lines as well. You need about 150, 200 completed surveys. Wow, in order to do that, I gotta send a thousand surveys out. That's a lot of companies to connect with and get data from. So it's a neat idea and trying to execute it is gonna be part of the next challenge. So I've already developed all the scales and measures, the survey instrument, the process for how to do this. Some of the challenges is that we gotta do field interviews first. We have to go out, talk to people to make sure, does this research model actually make sense? And if it doesn't make sense, you make adjustments. Because you don't want to send a survey out and say, uh-oh, we missed something. So we'll have some experts review the scale. I've actually had uh, plenty of people who do business in the Chinese environment review the scale already. But we also need to consider translation issues as well. Because a lot of the people that would fill out a survey like this, when you're sending out to 1,000 companies, when you're sending it out to a thousand companies, not everyone's going to have a full mastery of English in this environment. So how do we translate it into Chinese and verify that we translated it correctly as well? I took Chinese. I don't think I'll be able to develop my own survey. Uh, I'll try. It's not going to happen. <clears throat> so summary of the scales that are used, a lot of these scales are existing already. So open innovation, I've got the, so myself, my chair, Gene Johnson, Yanni Gregoire, we have an established scale in open innovation. Um, Interfirm relational knowledge stores, Jean shows up because she worked with Amit Sohi and uh, Raj Graywall on the key piece in that area. Initiation knowledge stores is a new scale. Social network characteristics, this is a field that has been established for decades. So there are existing scales that can be used here. Essentially what we're trying to do is find all the ways that being connected and connecting to influence success. And we've all taken science classes before where we want to take out any other possible explanation for this performance. <clears throat> so what else is influencing this? So that's why we have controls. Can you measure the strategic orientation of a company? There's an argument that says companies that are older tend to be more financially well off. Companies that are bigger tend to be more financially well off. So we remove all those possible excuses, all those possible explanations that can say, this is why the company is successful. And we delineate, we pull out an explanation to justify why they might be successful. Now the key thing here is, we're asking companies to fill out, or members of companies, quite often CEOs, VPs of research and development, managers in the, on the product side to fill this out. In general, they tend to be rather truthful filling this out. But there tends to be a bias at times when we're trying to say how your financial performance is. So what we do quite often to verify this is we'll get multiple people within an organization to fill out a survey. So we're talking about innovation. Oh yeah, we're great at innovation. We're, we're financially well off. So there's a bias that occurs from that standpoint. So quite often we'll send a survey out to two people within a company. One does the open innovation side, the other one does the firm performance. So you separate the two so you don't have a halo effect influencing this. So how are we going to go and do this? We're going to provide an incentive. Uh, and the key thing here is because there's already considerable interest in this area and there's research communities that have an interest in this particular study, we might not have to fight as hard on the incentive side. We're going to offer a free report. So as the study is completed, we'll offer an ability to review the results. So summary, a summary report, three pages, five pages, they're pretty easy to do. So here's the summary characteristics of the study. If you do this, this is what comes out of it. An opportunity to even go out onto sites and talk to people about really what are the findings from this? How, how can it be useful for you? 
so revisit and follow ups as well. Right? And these things tend to attract people to want to help out in the data collection. They feel that, okay, I'm contributing. I might also get something in return as well. And I'll give you an example. So I did, the open, did my open innovation study within the U.S., and I had uh, publicly traded companies in the technology environment as my sample. VPs of research and development, VPs of um, technology, and even CEOs in some organizations and a rather good response rate, about 30%, 32% response rate. And one of the most common themes, good idea, please follow up with me on how to be successful with it. So every one of them I responded back to, gave them summary reports, I talked to them, because we had VPs of Goodyear, VPs of General Electric, VPs of General, Motor, General Motors, all wanting to find out how to use this stuff and be successful with it. It's a pretty important topic. Uh, at least in the area of uh, product development and research development. So I believe that there is good potential for this study in China. So in conclusion, uh, the project, if I can get my ducks in a row properly, will very likely be in preliminary data collection next summer. Uh, when I'm in China, I'll be in Chengdu for, I believe, most of July. Um, at least that's what the plan is right now to start beginning a data collection and partnering with people in other cities as well. Any questions? It's a little bit of an academic piece, and I understand that. But if you want to have, if you've got any questions that are related to what does this really mean, I'm more than happy to talk about it. I see a few familiar p faces in the audience. Any clarification? I don't have bonus points today, sorry. Nothing? Yeah. What would you say in terms of, of China versus the US in terms of open innovation? Um, so what would you say um, in terms of like receptiveness? Mm -hmm. So that's a, actually a really good question. I did not see that one, just so everybody knows. I'm gonna go back to that model real quick. So what had happened was, remember when I talked about um, changes since the 1980s in China that have led to more incubators, research communities, and things like that? That's going to affect spillovers right here. So what happens is knowledge that leaks out. So any company that does work on research, knowledge tends to leak out. People go to conferences, they talk to their buddies, knowledge leaks out. So, oh, they're working on this. That's a cool idea. Oh, maybe I should do something too is one way to look at it. So the key difference between the U.S. and because Germany is uh, another area where open innovation research is done a great deal. Germany and the U.S. have some similarities, but they're quite a bit different than China in part because the research communities in the Western world have been around for a few decades more. So they're a lot more established. So we've got, and I'm not saying this in a bad way at all, because the research communities exist in China, the challenge is, is how do you manage network spillovers? So do you have a collective push by state institutions, Fed agencies, state agencies, whatever, to advance science? There's granting agencies in the U.S. that support a lot of research. And they don't expect a financial return on it. So you're advancing science, you're learning more about stuff, so you're doing more science. And how can that trickle out into the commercial environment? <clears throat> So in China, the challenge here is because I don't want to say infancy, it's relatively young still, this whole area of network spillovers. You got to work on technology moving forward. You got to work on connections moving forward. So it's slowly taking rapid growth. So the push is, at least from a policy standpoint, if it makes sense, do more of it. Make sense? Good question. And that's my argument. It needs to be more of it. I say there needs to be more of it worldwide. But when we're in an environment where we're decreasing funding to university institutions, we're actually shooting ourselves in the foot later because we're going to have less and less science advancing. So we need to put more into it so we can have more science advancing because there's so many examples of science done at the university level that has amazing commercial success. Plus it makes the market more competitive. Yep. Very important in the global economy. Yes. So with, I'm, I'm not projecting or predicting the future in any way, but those countries that are finding ways to support science communities are going to see greater and increasingly faster growing rates of 
economic performance for their companies in their host countries. It's just going to happen naturally because knowledge spillovers, technological spillovers is critical to this. And as we cut back spending, you pay for it later. That only really makes sense. Very good question. Fun stuff? Who wants to go to China now? I don't know, I do. Question? Yeah, can I ask you? Yeah, of course, Matt. Um, what, so how much of this open innovation occurs domestically and how, many of, how much of it occurs, I guess, between China and the U.S. or companies in China and the U.S.? Or, or does that happen? Do you know? Yes and no. Okay. There's a lot of companies that go in and have claimed to be able to want to partner in China. And some do, some do very well from a design standpoint. It's amazing how much early innovation stages. So when I showed you, oh, right, there. okay, not the messy one, this one. So this part of product development is called ideation, coming up with ideas. The historic perspective on manufacturing in China was, we're going to design it here. We'll find a low-cost alternative to produce products. The real growth in China right now is, yeah, manufacturing can be done. But it's amazing the amount of work that's occurring on this side, coming up with neat ideas, new solutions to existing problems. In China, there are more English-speaking engineers produced every year than they are in the U.S. So just imagine the potential right there. So you've got individuals that you can communicate with. You've got science moving along. Look at Volvo. New product design just recently. And do you think it raised the eyebrows of the German makes and the U.S. makes? Yep. Who are the chief engineers behind that one? It's a Chinese company now, right? So the growth opportunity is right here. So instead of focusing on producing products at a low-cost alternative in China, how to partner here and advance new ideas, new way of thinking. Because we go back to the not invented here syndrome. There are too many companies going in thinking we've got the best ideas and we just want a low cost production facility. No, your opportunity is on this side as well. Good question. So this is ideation all the way to product development. So you come up with neat ideas and you advance it through the stages of product development. It's still early in the process for open innovation, it really is. But if we don't figure out the what are called mechanisms to be successful with it, it'll be a neat idea, but we'll never figure out how to be successful with it. It's no different than uh, Toyota and Just-in-Time. So Toyota has this methodology where they want to produce vehicles in a certain time, in a certain fashion, in order to be efficient. A lot of other companies try to adopt that methodology. The problem is, is that there's many other pieces that are needed in order to be successful with it, just like open innovation. Open innovation sounds nice. There's research that says, yeah, you can have financial performance. And I'll give you an example in just a sec. Um, the challenge is that there's other pieces that are needed in order to be successful. So the science communities need to be there. The ability to partner with other companies should be there. But also keep in mind, that the market is changing so rapidly and so quickly in China, you can't just sit on your laurels, sit on your heels, and say it's magically going to come to me. It's not going to happen. So in regards to this open innovation thing and financial performance, what we found is, and there's research that supports this as well, is you have to have, in order to be successful with open innovation and get that financial performance, you have to have a little bit of flexibility in your company. So as a neat idea comes along, early on here, can you respond to it, can you adapt it, can you borrow it, and move quickly? Because if you don't move quickly and it's freely available, someone else is going to take it. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. And as you know, the, the, uh, in Portland, there is a famous, uh, the, uh, so Nike, the company, the high portion of the company, NIKE. Oh, Nike, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, as we know, there are uh, 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 a large number of shoe, shoe makers mm -hmm. and manufacturers. Yeah. They, product, they produce 
they make shoes. Yeah. So could you give us the uh, explanation, the uh, how, you know, the high quality in Portland, mm -hmm. but the manufacturer in, in, Guang, in Dongguan, near Guangzhou. Yeah. There's a number of, it's a... Uh I forget, the, they have a name for the district where there's a lot of production that occurs with shoe manufacturing. So for example, what one could do is to say, okay, we've got a lot of companies that can produce shoes well, but they learn a lot on what types of materials are more appropriate, what's the best types of materials to use, what's more cost effective, what is going to help make products last longer as well, because cost is not the only thing. Customers can buy $20 shoes if they wanted to buy $20 shoes. But if a customer wants to buy a pair of shoes that will last for two years or three years, the price might be different. So what we could do is look at what is occurring over here. What types of materials are best to use? So a manufacturer, sorry, a designer in the U.S., like Nike or whoever, could come up with an idea. This is the type of design that I would like. But they could partner with businesses that have intellectual property in specific materials. Because with shoes, lightweight, durability are very important from a cost standpoint. So what if a company is able to do research and development for new materials and then partner with the likes of Nike? Because even Brooks is producing heavily in Asia now as well. And they historically wanted to be in uh, the US. Brooks, Asex, Nike, they're all producing heavily in Asia. But they all have a competitive problem, durability, reliability, cost-effective. Yes. So what if companies are able to advance science and say, we're advancing science here. Why don't you partner with us so that we can help you also produce your products? Yes. It's no different than, say, Johnson Controls uh, in the automotive industry. They work on advancing science that is used in components for cars. And then General Motors, Ford will work with them to make better cars. And it, it, it's a very good question. It just, it's not done enough. Right? It's uh, the perspective that China is only a manufacturing environment is yesterday's news. That, that is so yesterday. Because innovation in China, that's what's leading to entrepreneurial growth right now. That's the rapid uptick. And of course, the managing on the finance and the financial markets as well. I mean, that's important. You need them hand in hand. But innovation is where it's at. I'm biased. It's my area. No problem. Good question. Everybody good? No other questions? Thank you for the opportunity. I appreciate it.